It is a pleasure for me to stand before you. Thank you to North Phoenix Church and the leadership for giving me this wonderful invitation to come all the way from Africa, Zambia, to be here with you and share my testimony. Before I share my testimony, I would love to share something with you that is inspiring to me. I was in Antioch, and I met with Wes Yuri, and uh, he told me something that was interesting that I would love you to hear. He said that when he was back home and, uh, with Melinda, and uh, during the time she started becoming ill, he got worried, and he got to a point where he started having bitterness and anger inside of his heart. And Melinda noticed that. And after she saw that, she called him by the side and told him these words. She said, Wes, do you know that even though I'm sick and I'm having MS, I can still do MS with Jesus? Don't worry about me. I can do it all in Christ. Amen. That's amazing. <laughs> Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you, Lord, for this awesome privilege that you've given to us to gather together. We pray, stir us up, that we may live to grow in love with you. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Uh, I'm going to share with you a testimony about my life. Simply, um, in, in the year 2006, I was imprisoned in a foreign nation that is neighbor to my home country, Zambia, and uh, this nation is a Tanzania. You pronounce it uh, in a different way here. In 2006, and I spent two years in prison, and I was released in 2008, October. So basically, you would love to know what happened for me to get into prison. How did it happen? And how was a prison experience? How did I get out of prison? And how does God look at all of that? Well, I remember when I was doing my last year of secondary education back home in Zambia, I received a call of God into ministry. On that day, I purposed to serve God in full-time ministry. And I got involved in a number of ministries at church, namely, Street Kids Ministry, where we would gather street children from the streets, bring them in, and feed them with the Word of God. That is abandoned children on the streets who would gather them. We got involved in hospital ministry, where we would go into the hospitals in Zambia and pray for patients and lead them to Christ. And um, I got involved in uh, a number of other ministries in the local church. During that time, the church leadership saw the call of God in my life. They gave me this small church to lead, and I started leading that church. As I led that church, I saw my need of going to seminary. But the challenge was, in Africa, for an average family, for an average family to lead their children into college, it's very, very expensive. And my father did not have money then. And because of that reason, I struggled, not knowing where I would be able to do my college education. Uh, on one, one of those days, my father came back home with a newspaper. It had an advert in it about Northrise University. Northrise University is a private university that was established by a man called Moffat Zimba and his wife Doreen Zimba. They established this university after a lot of struggles in their personal lives in trying to find an education back home in Zambia. And by the grace of God, they came over to America, and uh, God blessed them with a wonderful education. And they decided to say, we are not going to stay in America. We are going back home in Zambia, and we are going to make a difference and provide an education for our fellow Zambians. And I'm grateful to the Lord. As I'm standing here today, Northrise University is standing. It is a private university, a Christian university, a university with Christian values, and uh, it is living to make a great impact in the nation of Zambia as it lives to educate many other Zambians of which I am a product. I remember in a class that we had at Northrise University, and our lecture was uh, the founder of the university, Moffat Zimba. He was teaching us on an interesting subject. It was called leadership preparation a theology class. 
And in that class, he was telling us about the story of Joseph from the Bible in the book of Genesis, chapter 39, where the Bible talks about Joseph, a young man who went out to see his brothers in the fields, and his brothers beat him up, and they sold him into Egypt as a slave. When he went into Egypt, the Bible says that he started working as a slave, and later on he was falsely imprisoned. And after being imprisoned for a period of over two years, he was released out of prison and became the vice president in the nation of Egypt. Now, he went on and said these words. He said, God prepares people for leadership in various ways. It's not always in an orthodox way where people are seated in a classroom and are prepared. God even uses hardships, difficulties, even prison. Then we were seated in a class of about 13 people. Then as he was saying those words, he reached out and pointed at me and said, God can even take this one, Mulenga Chela, and lead him into prison in order to prepare him for ministry. And I went like, what? <laughs> After the class ended, I went back home and I prayed to God. I said, Lord, I don't want this to ever happen to me. <laughs> a few weeks later, I was praying with this friend of mine in a house. We were busy praying to Jesus, loving him, and just desiring for more of him in our lives. And as we were praying, this friend of mine gets up and he said these words. He said, Mulenga, I hear the Lord is saying that he is proud of the work that you're doing as a minister. And I hear him saying that he's going to send you from a, into a foreign nation. And in that foreign nation, you are going to suffer very much and you're going to be imprisoned. And thereafter, God is going to bless you. Now, when he said those words, in my heart, I was saying, mm -mm, this is not God. <laughs> This is not from God. And again, after that meeting, I went back home. And I... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and when I went back home, I prayed again. I said, Lord, I don't want this to ever happen to me. And uh, after I prayed that prayer, a few days later, I was watching television. And on TV, there was this American white woman. She was teaching the Word of God from the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 38, where the Bible talks about the angel of the Lord going to Mary and telling her that he shall bear a child. And Mary went like, how can it be? I do not know a man. And the angel of the Lord told her that there is nothing that is impossible with God. And Mary surrendered her life to the Lord and said, be it unto me according to your word. And this woman went on and said these words. She said, surrender your life to God, just like Mary surrendered her life to God. Even if God wants to use you as a missionary, surrender. Even if God wants to use you yeah, by taking you into prison so that you can preach the word of God there, surrender. Now, when this woman mentioned the word prison, it pricked my heart because I came to understand that the Lord was speaking to me about sending me into prison so that I can serve him. And uh, I remember I got broken in my spirit. I went into my room and I knelt down before the Lord and I lifted up my hands. I said, Lord, I no longer hold back. I no longer hold back. I will no longer pursue my own will. I choose to surrender to your will. May your word prevail in my life. Be it unto me according to your will. And I remember after praying that prayer, 10 months later, I met this man in Zambia. This man said he was a missionary in Tanzania, helping orphans and widows. He was an African man. And when I met with him, uh, he invited me to go with him to Tanzania. And I started off on a journey with him. When we arrived in Tanzania, to my surprise, police officers pounced on us. And the first time in my life, I had a gun being pointed to my head. I went like, what's happening here? The police officers told me that the person that I was with, who had told me that he was a missionary, was an international criminal. And the vehicle that we were traveling in was a stolen vehicle. And uh, when he said those words, uh, he told me that because I was a foreigner with a criminal in a, in a stolen vehicle, the chances were that I too was a criminal. And I ended up in prison for two years. Now. When you talk about African prisons, comparing them to American prisons, your prisons are what we can consider five-star hotel. <laughs> African prisons are bad. 
I remember before being taken into the prison cell, the prison lockup, um, the, before a person is taken to the main prison, you go into a cell, a prison uh, lockup, a police lockup. In that place, it's a tiny room, about um, three meters by five meters long. And uh, in that room, it is congested, it had about 40 men who slept on concrete floor. The place was dirty, and there were bed bugs all around the wall. Not only that, the room had no running water in the toilet, and the toilet was just by the corner. And uh, when you are locked in that place, you are not allowed to leave that place. You don't go out to bath, you don't go out to, to, to change or see your relatives. You are locked right in there until you are, you, you are taken into prison. Before I was placed in that little room, I had five dollars in my pocket. I decided to give that money over to the police officer so that he could keep it for me. But the guys who were inside that cell were criminals, and they saw me giving the money to the police officer. They started shouting out, asking for money from me. When the police officer put me in that cell, the guys became furious and started searching me for money. I had nothing, so they became angry and beat me up. And after being beaten, punched with blows, I was thrown right into the toilet, and it had no running water. And I remember I spent the whole night there, and I cried to the Lord. I said, Lord, why? Why have you allowed me to suffer like this? Why have you allowed me to come into prison after I have been seeking you and saving you faithfully as a pastor? Why, Lord? After I'd prayed the whole night, one of the guys who had beaten me up noticed that I had prayed. So the guy calls me, gives me a little bit of water to wash off the debt, and after I washed it off, this man asks me to pray for them because they were going to face their, their charges in court. So he asked me to pray for them so that they can be released. And guess what an, a temptation that was to me because I would have prayed a dangerous prayer for their death, but God touched my heart. God compelled me by his grace and his love, and uh, I led them to Christ. They received the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and I prayed for God to go before them as they went to face their charges. And when they went out, guess what happened? They were released, and I got to spend two years in prison. After the police cell, we were taken now into prison. Now, prison is also another bad story because you get to find a room that was meant to accommodate 15 people accommodates 50 to 70 people. It's a situation where you have a one-meter one width mattress that is meant to be slept on by one person. Three people are sleeping on it. That's African prison. When you look at the food that is prepared there, it was bad food. I mean, you have a small glass of uh, partially boiled beans in it without any ingredients in it. That was the daily food. I remember one of the, 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 the people who were sleeping on a mattress next to my mattress was a person who was insane. This guy had killed his father, mother, and two other relatives in one day with an axe. So when he's sleeping right there next to you, you get to pray. I, I used to pray endlessly in my heart to say, Lord, protect me. It was tough. How did I get out of prison? You see, the person who had deceived me and told me that he was a missionary and yet he was an international criminal was arrested together with me in prison. When we were taken into prison, this man had plans of escaping out of prison. And when his prison attempts failed, he decided to commit suicide. When he decided to commit suicide, the police the prison officer in charge of the prison called me by the side and he said these words to me. He said, Mulenga, we know that you are a minister of the word of God. We know that you are innocent and we've seen your heart here in prison. But we know that this man is a wicked man. He's a criminal and uh, he, has, uh, caused, he has ruined your life in, 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 in bringing you over into prison. Now that he's sick and is unconscious, let him be, let him die. 
Because if you help him, the police officers, together with the magistrates in court, are going to conclude that he is, uh, you, you are his ally in all of the criminal activities he's been doing. So let him be, just let him die. Friends, I am grateful to the Lord that when I entered that prison, I entered with a small Bible that I read every day. And as I read the Bible, in the midst of those challenges and difficulties in prison, I felt God speak to me. I felt his strength. I felt his counsel. I felt God guide me. And I'm grateful because I received one of those Bibles from Northrise University. And Northrise University received a box of Bibles from friends and sponsors of Northrise here in America who packed those Bibles and sent them over to Africa. Friends, we are grateful for the love that you continue to show to us from America. We are grateful for your generosity, your love, and the, the, the kindness that you continue to express to us because we are blessed because of you. If I had not had that Bible when I entered into prison, I would not have come out alive of that prison. I am grateful for that. Well, when I was reading the Bible, I came across Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, where the Bible tells us the following words. Pray for those who persecute you and love your enemies. And I felt God strongly speak to me through that verse. God was telling me to love my enemy. Loving my enemy meant that I had to go to my enemy who was unconscious for two weeks and nurse him. And of course, you know that when a person is unconscious, they cannot go to the bathroom, to the toilet. They cannot uh, uh, help themselves in those means. So I had to do all the dirty work. And God was telling me to do it. And if I did obey the word of God, it also meant that the prison officer and the magistrates in court are going to conclude that I'm his ally in all of his criminal activities and possibly be convicted together with him. It was a dangerous thing to do. And as I sat there thinking, what should I do? All the prisoners inside of prison said, this man is a wicked man. Let him be, let him die, don't help him. But I am grateful to the Lord that as I continued meditating on that word, God compelled me by his grace and his grace alone to reach out to my enemy and help him. And I remember I had to take him from the place where he was unconscious into the prison host clinic that was about 100 meters away, and he had uh, diarrhea and all the debt was piling up in the way. I took him there, cleaned him up, washed him, and started feeding him. And during those days, I got very, very thin. Even the prisoners inside of prison felt pity for me. And uh, I remember during those times, as I was doing that hard work and cleaning him, I started thinking to myself, what is life? What is uh, the meaning of life? When you are falsely imprisoned, when you are eating bad food, when you don't have all the luxuries and the pleasures of life, what's the meaning of life? It was in those moments that the Lord started teaching me that life is an opportunity. It's an opportunity that God gives to us, an opportunity to love, an opportunity to serve, an opportunity to honor God and mankind. Even though I was in prison, God had given me a great opportunity, an opportunity to love my enemy, an opportunity to serve my enemy, an opportunity to honor God by doing that. And this is what I remember. As I went on picking up his debt, as I went on cleaning him and feeding him, I was saying to the Lord from the depth of my heart, saying, Lord, I'm doing this for you. I love you. I'm doing this as an expression of my love to you. I'm thinking about you. Lord Jesus, I love you. And I remember as I said those words from the depth of my heart to God, I felt an, an overwhelming presence of God. I felt his strength. I felt the peace of God that transcends all human understanding rest upon me and the grace to carry on out of prison. Two weeks later, that man recovered. And that man was a wicked man. He had no mercy and no compassion for people. But to my surprise, whenever he saw me in prison, he would shed tears, he would cry. When the day of defense and judgment in court came, the man stood up before everyone and said the following words. He pointed at me and said, this man is an innocent man. He does not know anything about all my criminal activities. I simply carried him in the vehicle like an ordinary passenger. 
And those words he spoke opened the door for, my, for me to get out of prison. Friends, guess what would have happened if I had disobeyed the word of God? That man would have died and I would have lost my ticket of going out of prison because of obeying the word of God, even when it did not make sense to me, even though naturally it meant that I would be uh, seen as an ally of this enemy. As a result of obeying the word of, the word of God, God opened the prison doors for me to get out of prison. <coughs> Friends, when I look at all of the two years that I had spent in prison, all the suffering, all the pain and the misery, if God had given me the power to change these events in the past, can I change them? No. I cannot change them. Why can't I change them? When I look at the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 2 to 5, the Bible talks about a time God took the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, but before they went into the promised land, he took them into the wilderness, into the desert for 40 years. And the Bible says the following words, that God took the children of Israel into the desert, into the wilderness, wilderness for 40 years in order to humble them, in order to test them, in order to see what was in their hearts, whether they would obey his word or not and in order to teach them that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from his mouth. And in order to discipline them, just like a father disciplines a child that he loves. Friends, God laid me into the prison for two years in order to humble me, in order to test me and see what was in my heart, whether I would obey his word or not. And in order to teach me, that man does not live on bread alone. Man does not live on the luxuries of life, on good food, on comfort, and all the other things that uh, uh, people long for in life. But man lives on God's word and God's word alone. God led me into the desert in order to discipline me, just like a father disciplines a child that he loves. Looking at the book of Genesis, chapter 50, verse 20, the Bible talks about Joseph after he had been blessed by God and his brothers were scared of him, thinking that he would do them ill. Joseph spoke these words to them. He said to them, what you did to me by send, selling me over into Egypt, you did evil against me. You planned evil, but God used what you did against me for good, for the saving of many lives. And I am grateful today that God, God has used my prison experience and he continues to use it to touch lives. I'm here speaking the word of God, encouraging people everywhere I go through the prison experience because of that very same uh, challenge I had. God is using it for God. God is using it for God. Friends, as I stand here, I'm encouraging you. You might be going through a bad situation today. You might be going through a prison experience. That may not necessarily mean you going into prison but it is hard and painful. I'm here to encourage you from the Bible in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 28, which says, in all things, God works them together for good to them that love and serve the Lord. As you go through that pain, as you go through that challenge, continue loving the Lord. Continue seeking him. Continue saying to him, Lord, I'm doing this and I'm pulling through my challenges as an expression of my love and passion for you. I love you. And he will be with you. He will lead you through it. And he shall work out your challenges for good. I'll end here. Thank you. Malinga, you have heard a wonderful response. Uh, once again, your testimony is so refreshing, so honest. Uh, it inspires us, and, and there's a thousand questions that come to mind. Uh, 
Did you feel abandoned by your family, by your friends during this time? How did you deal with that sense of hopelessness in the prison? Mm. What took place that helped you? Thank you, Dan. That's a good question. I remember after I got into prison, I got to a point where the enemy started feeding my mind with the following thoughts. God is not real. If God is real and is there, why am I in prison? Because I've been seeking him and serving him faithfully and I've never committed any crime or did anything that would deserve me to be in prison. Is God real? And the enemy started feeding me with those thoughts of doubt. And I remember I came to a point where I resolved from the depth of my heart and said to the Lord to say, whether God delivers me out of prison or I die in prison, I would die trusting in him. I would die believing in him. And that helped. Because the moment I resolved that, I held on to the Bible. I held on to God in prayer. And I am grateful as I stand here, God has delivered me out of prison and proved himself true. My family and how they got, um, how they, 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 they went through all of this. When I went into Tanzania, prison, the prisons, uh, it's difficult to communicate, especially communicating with your families and friends who are in a foreign nation. So there was no communication for me. How did my parents get to know about it? There's a friend of mine who went into the internet and Googled my name, Mulenga Chela. Then my name popped up, and the headline was, a pastor, a, a man claiming to be a pastor, and, uh, two men claiming to be pastors have been caught stealing a, a motor vehicle. And that was the headline. When my parents got to hear of that, they wept and sobbed. And uh, my father decided to come over uh, into that very country. And when he came into that country, this is what happened. Um, I was called, I was with, together with prisoners, and I was dirty and thin, and then he called me. When I went into the office of the prison officer in, in charge, I found my father. When he looked at me, he cried and sobbed. And when he cried, I knew he had no money, and he had no means of taking me out of prison. And as long as he continued staying there, his high blood pressure was continue shooting. So I thought, what am I going to tell him? And then I remembered. In the year 2004, I had a birthday, and my parents had no money to buy me presents. So my father took me, and then he prayed for me and dedicated me to the Lord. He said, Lord, this is your son. I give him over back to you. May you use him for your glory. And when my father said that, I, um, when my father came to prison, and he was there worried, and um, I didn't have any words to say, I remembered what had happened in 2004. Then I looked, up, looked him up in the eyes and I said, Dad, do you remember in 2004 you dedicated me to the Lord? He said, yes. Then I told him, I am in God's hands. Go back home. God will care for me. And I'm grateful to the Lord that he really took care for me in a way that my father and my relatives could not have taken care of me. Parents, please dedicate your children to the Lord. You lost a lot of time. Mm. You were treated poorly. Mm. No bitterness. Mm. No bitterness in your spirit. Mm. How, how did that happen? Amen. Friends, I am human. And uh, as a human being, definitely you get to feel anger, bitterness, resentment, and all of those negative feelings. But one of my great strengths was the Word of God. I remember as I was there in prison, the main thing I used to do was pray and read the Word. Pray and read the Word. And I'm grateful to the Lord. As I had my time there in prison, I felt the Word of God become alive to me. I felt God speak to me. I felt the Lord encourage me and strengthen me. And as I continued reading the Bible, I read verses and passages like, in all things rejoice. Again and, and again I say rejoice from the book of Thessalonians. 
and uh, I decided to obey the word of God just as I had resolved to believe in him. Now, the amazing thing, as I was there in prison, reading the word of God, meditating on the word of God, I felt an, an overwhelming presence of God, just like the Bible tells us from the book of Psalms 24, verse 4, 27, verse 4, where the Bible says, One thing I have asked of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and gaze upon his beauty forever. As I was reading the word of God, I felt the presence of God. And I got to a point in prison where I said to the Lord, Lord, I love your presence. I love worshiping you. I love uh, seeking your presence. And if you know that when I go out of prison, I'm going to move away from your grace. I'm going to backslide. I don't want to go out of prison. I would rather spend the rest of my life in prison seeking you, loving you, gazing upon your beauty and worshiping you, rather than going out of prison and doing things that are out of your will. You've been to the United States now. You've been speaking on college campuses. You've been around many, many churches like ours. Uh, would you speak to us about your view of Christianity in America and our churches? Uh, would you give us some insight and some understanding to how we could experience that kind of faith that you've shared with us? What, what challenges do you see for the American church? Amen. Thank you for that wonderful question, Dan. <laughs> when I Look at the Bible in the book of Isaiah 43, verse 10 to 13. The Word of God has interesting words there. And um, I quote, it says, You are my witnesses that I am God. You are my chosen servants. You are my witnesses that you may understand, that you may know that I am He. And in verse 12, it goes on to say, You are my witnesses that I am now, that is God telling the children of Israel that they were witnesses. Why were they witnesses? They were witnesses because they got to see God deliver them from Egypt into the promised land. They got to see the power of God as he parted the Red Sea for them and they walked on dry ground. As they, God fed them with manna, they were witnesses of his love, of his provision, of his mighty power in saving them. They were witnesses of God answering their prayers and their cries. And I'm grateful to the Lord that through this experience that I had, I am a witness. I have seen God answer me. I've seen God deliver me. I've seen his hand at work in my life. And because of that, I stand to testify that he is. And I would not allow anyone to rob that away from me because it has given me a deeper and much more intimate relationship with him than all that I could ever have had in other means. When it comes to America, I definitely would not um, suggest you going into prison in order for you to have that. <laughs> Friends, I believe America is founded on the principles of your forefathers, men and women who struggled in order for America to be what it is to, today, men and women who sought the face of God, men and women who prayed to God earnestly, men and women who established this nation on biblical principles. They prayed for this nation to be where it is. The number one challenge that the children of Israel had after God delivered them from Israel is that they forgot easily and they started complaining and they moved away from God. But the answer for them was to remember. I believe the greatest answer for America is to remember to remember how your forefathers struggled and how God delivered them, how God has answered their prayers, how God has been faithful to them, and in so doing, respond with love to God. The number one request I believe God has for America is for you to love him more because he's blessed you more, to seek him more because he's blessed you more, to get to a point where you commit your hearts to him in deep love and adoration of him because of the great things that he's done for you. I believe that's the right response for you. You don't need to suffer for you to experience God in a deeper way. Just resolve in your heart to love him more because he's been gracious to you. He's blessed you greatly and he loves you dearly.
The man you met in prison, who is now in prison for life, mm -hmm. uh, can you give us a little background and you bring us up to date? Mm -hmm. Is this someone we can pray for with you? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, it's a sad thing to say, but let me say it anyway. As I went into prison, I came to discover that people who are in prison, mostly, mostly, not everyone, mostly, are poor people. They do not have people, finances, and resources to fight for them. And um, sad to say, most of the people I found there were poor people who had no means of getting out of prison financially, and they end to spend the rest of their lives in prison. So finding a good attorney for him would definitely open the doors for him to get out. So we can be involved in helping you to help him. Yes. All right. If, if this was the last time we ever saw each other, mm -hmm. and I hope it isn't. Amen. Uh, would you, do you have a, 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 an idea, do you have a word from the Lord, do you have a thought that you would share with us today that, that has entered your mind since you've been speaking to different groups in our church and now this morning? Yes. Do you have a word just for this moment? Amen. You are asking the right questions. I love you. Amen. You see, when I was back home in Zambia, the Lord told me about surrendering to him over going into prison. It was a hard thing for me to do. I went home, I denied it. I prayed against it. But after going through prison and coming out today, I've come to understand that the best thing that could have happened for my life was the will of God. Friends, as I'm standing here, God desires you to be saved. He wants you to get to a point where you have an intimate relationship with him, where you surrender all your life without holding anything back. The Bible tells us that God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, in order to die for us. He bled on Calvary that you and I may be saved today. And if there is anything above everything else that God wants you to do, he wants you to surrender your life to him. He wants you to receive Jesus Christ in your heart and in your life that you may make him your Lord and Savior and live your life for him forevermore. Amen.